Hi folks, welcome. We're gonna get started. Um, we're gonna treat this kind of like a taping. I know that we have people on our live stream. I'm appreciative to everyone who's gathered here. I'm very, very grateful and excited that we have Latasha and Nevada Diggs and Pamela Sneed with us. Um, so welcome to the Poetry Project. I'm Kyle DeCoyan. I'm the executive director here. Um, we're so thrilled to be continuing this weekend a series of readings, performances, and talks as part of a symposium organized and co-produced by the Racial Imaginary Institute, the CUNY Graduate Center, and the Poetry Project. On nationalism, the fragility and the possibility of we brings together poets, artists, scholars, and performance makers working through a breadth of questions and critiques considering nation and the national, their histories and possible futures, and imagining what counter modes of collectivity might be and hold. Last weekend at Judson Memorial Church, the Racial Imaginary Institute presented readings and conversations with Lele Long Soldier, Banu Kapil, Jackie Wang, Uraiwan Noel, Tavia and Yango, Rune Steenberg, and a number of others, and today I'm very grateful to be with Latasha Diggs and Pamela Sneed for a pair of readings and subsequent conversation considering the crossings of voice and memory. What constitutes these subjects, how they form one another, and where the harmonics of voice and memory situate us in relation to people and place. We're going to begin with a reading from Pamela Sneed then I'll come back and briefly introduce Latasha Diggs, and then we'll have a conversation. All right. Good afternoon. How are we doing? I'm, uh, I'm pretty thrilled to be here, uh, to be part of this conversation. Um, honored uh, all the people that are involved, Claudia, Kaya, Latasha. Um, so here's a, here's a new poem I started, and uh, I've never read it, but it feels apropos. Not sure at all how this will fit into the discussion, the paradigm, the me too. Sometimes I assert, shout, whisper, wrench myself in between the cracks against fervent denials. I want to say, I don't want to say, but most of my perpetrators have been women. I say this to a class of women after watching the film on Andrea Dworkin railing against male abuse, rape, but the film doesn't say how we no longer need men to abuse us. Women have eternalized the isms, the hatred. We repeatedly rape, scar other women with the acidity of fear, competition. Reminds me of that old adage of an elephant kept in captivity. And finally, when the chains are removed, they will stay. It's all they know. My students this time, all adults, agree how in business, at the office, the beatings by women are worse, are the worst, not the male bosses. But one student, a woman in my writing class, asserts, but what have we here? Six women. We love, support, we listen, hold space, heal. Described as an honor killing, in Iraq, a heterosexual man traveled from abroad and killed his sister, a transgender woman. Police knew she was in danger instead of protection, told her to hide, move far away. Friends said she was full of light, wouldn't hurt a soul, was a hairdresser. The perpetrator, her brother, was not arrested, fled by car to a neighboring country. In the same country, another woman weeps, saying that her husband and son have murdered the transgender child she birthed in an honor killing. All over the world, there are burns and scars of women disfigured beyond recognition by some flimsily constructed porous excuse called protecting the family honor. 
I want to but can't separate what occurred at the Academy Awards in the United States. A black man slaps another claiming to have dishonored another's wife. At the end of that argument, I see violence and death, male egos. If this were medieval times, perhaps a duel was in order. But in 2022, all I can do is cry, question. My friend says the slap was indicative of our moment, maybe almost post-pandemic, an upside-down world caused by sickness and death, endless quarantines, inflation, senseless violence abounds. I won't even mention my music teacher, murdered in an act that I will never be able to make sense of. I keep going, afraid to stop. In the last few years of his life, my father gained ability to see me. The woe, as they like to say, fell off slowly over time. Whenever I'd visit the last few years, he'd say, you're a good girl, what a sweetheart. I put him on the phone once in a video call with friends from New York. He just said, she's a good girl, over and over. I didn't realize then he was trying to protect me. I never told him the breadth of it, but he guessed that all those years I came home alone, I'd been hurt and misnamed. I never told him what went on, but years back I had a friend dying of AIDS. I asked my friend, uh, my father for clothes to give to him. Years later, my father asked about him. I said, we don't talk so much anymore. And my father became angry and shouted, you're the only reason why that guy is alive today. I know my father's ability to finally see me had something to do with forgiveness. When mountainous rock and stones are moved away, when what replaces, when what has hardened uh, melts, what replaces it is pure and liquid. Despite horrible treatment, lack of acceptance, care, threats, giving away all I stand to inherit, Despite the lies, the passing for white, the hatred towards black women and girls, in specific me. Despite the competing, the constant need to feel better at tremendous cost. Despite the selfishness, lack of generosity, never in my life receiving five dollars except on Christmas, maybe. Despite the mental illness, the lack of responsibility by almost everyone, including her, I still kind of secretly admire my mother. That still, amidst all, she, she still creates her enemy, still creates an escape. The only lessons of marriage she gave were the black and blue bruises, the advice not to let this happen to me, get an education, she'd say. Throughout all of my father's beating, she always kept a blue suitcase. I'm leaving, she'd say, though she never did. The last 20 years, she believes that there's a man who robs her daily, steals food, clothes, jewelry, takes the knobs off drawers, destroys plants. She says, I'm moving. I've got to get away. I think of my mother still as one of the slaves I most admire, the ones who took freedom into their own hands, would not accept the yoke. Daily, she plans an escape, even if it's dream or delusion, my mother is a runaway. As little as I tried, I could not bring myself to watch when they see us about the, about the Central Park Five or surviving R. Kelly, too many scenes of subjection. So flipping through the streaming services, I settled on a good old-fashioned rom-com called Twilight between a vampire and a young white woman named Bella they're teenagers. It's kind of cool, and the music is totally early 90s London, The Cure. And their romance goes on for about five movies without breaking up, so that's a feat. And it all works if you suspend belief. And I enjoyed it until the race consciousness part of me crept in, and I asked, why are these two guys going on about this pouty white girl for five movies? The Native American werewolf guy just kind of tags along. I mean, Kristen Stewart is cool, and she's a butch dyke in real life, but why would these men fight over this white woman for eternity? I think things, too, like if you're a vampire, you can get away with stuff like having no boundaries, because he pops into Bella's room at every, at any hour of the night, which would be stalking. 
My race, race consciousness interjects itself into every scene I watch. Por ejemplo, I watched A Star is Born. For the first 10 minutes, I was incredulous. All I could think of was the Black Panther breakthrough, followed up by a box office dominated by a, a movie about two white straight people in love. In the era of unspeakable violence against women, girls, trans people, and women of people of color, and we are made to watch and value two white people in love. Imagine at the height of apartheid in South Africa, Mandela jailed, Biko murdered, and the box office offers white romantic fantasies, white people while people are fighting for their lives. I was just incredulous. But then it picked up and I decided to stay. By the way, I was really offended during Black History Month when they decided to re-release Black Panther in, in movie theaters for free so black could, kids could see it. I mean, imagine if the whole of white history were shoved or compacted into one month, not the entire year as it exists now, and they decided to re-release Toy Story as a celebration of white culture. Give me a break. All films are race films, like it or not. Like I rewatched Black Panther, innocently kind of enjoyed myself, but the message is your brother, not the FBI, is your enemy. It gives little context of white oppression. It's like discussing the Rwandan massacre, excluding the role Belgium played in tribal warfare. Anyway, I watched the film Infinity Wars, a superhero farce. The white go boys go to battle it out in Wakanda, which is a fictitious Africa. And I was kind of excited to see all the black characters again. I was also told in Endgame, all of Wakanda is wiped out. But I was watching a fight scene, and while Wakanda is supposed to have mega resources like vibranium and technology, but I had to blink my eyes twice because during battle, I was like, wait a minute, is that a spear? I leaned in close. The black people were using spears and riding rhinos like in old Tarzan movies, and the white superheroes were using technology to fight, go figure. And then I watched Skull Island, curious about how they'd handle King Kong, and even more curious than placing Kong in Africa, surrounded by oil-painted natives, this King Kong was god of a Polynesian island. And while he and Samuel Jackson face off in what could be called a black-on-black -black crime, they mirror each other, their nostrils flare in exactly the same way when they're angry, and each will kill to protect their own. White responsibility and racism absolved. And just one more thing, can we talk about Ben Affleck? No diss, because we're all human after all. But I need to know why Hollywood continues to put money behind him. All of his movies except Goodwill Hunting have flopped. They they say Giggly made with Jennifer Garner was down and lost 98 million. Still, they made Ben a superhero Batman. Everything tanked, but it goes to show you how much money goes into Hollywood myth-making, a heterosexual white man, Cary Grant, Burt Reynolds, all the money, $98 million could feed, forest fires put out, animals alive, saved, and free. All right, you all can talk to me. <laughs> the opening lines to Halle Berry's film Bruised says in heavy-handed metaphor describing the character, justice has taken a beating. And if the analogy or metaphor is America, it sure has. Just days after a young white man was acquitted of acquiring an assault weapon, attending a Black Lives Matter protest, and killing two unarmed people, wounding another, and all the participants and instigators of the January 6th attack on Capitol Hill have not been charged, including the former president who instigated and set up a war room to watch while other key members of government bust the looters to and from the place. And we we all know if they were black, the police would have swarmed, uh, would have swarmed the place, SWAT teams and helicopters. No one would have left the grounds. They would have been corralled. They would have shut down the city like they did after those two kids set off a bomb at the Boston Marathon. They would have gone door to door. There would have been a curfew. There are Black Panthers still rotting in prison and on death row, lives destroyed for lots less than the Capitol rioters. In Texas and Mississippi, the Supreme Court is trying to overturn Roe versus Wade. And so, as in the film, justice 
has been abandoned. Justice has abandoned her children. Justice is down and out. Justice has been assaulted. Justice has been robbed. And in the end, as in the real life killers of Amut Arbery prosecuted and held accountable through a great battle, justice eventually triumphs. But we all know in America this is idealistic, surely not the case. And two, I have problems with Halle Berry's depiction of black and poor or working class women. Even the white reviewers are bruised or shocked by the stereotypes in utter debasement. Halle always gets this faux southern down home accent like Obama when he lectures. And we all know the hood in the South is where ne neither he nor she is from. And I have to say it's brilliant to redo the film Rocky from a black woman's standpoint, have the trainer be a visible black lesbian in the women's world of sports. The trainer played by Sheila is tall, dark, and lanky. And it becomes even a bit of a love story between Hallie's character and the trainer, which is a bold choice. They even make love. I thought, wow. But I was also ambivalent, asking, is Hallie cashing in on the queer cinema craze? But then I thought, maybe she's smart and fluid. But when she told the character, you're the most beautiful person I've ever met, I already knew where it was going. She didn't tell the tall, black, dark-skinned woman, you're beautiful, that says, I want to be on my own. She doesn't even say, let's check back later. So she's used and abandoned. And in that big fight scene between Rocky and Apollo Creed, Adrian's character makes it a love story. The black lesbian and bruised never attends the fight at all, used up until she's no longer needed, and the last scenes are between Hallie and a man. But the film still ends on a touching note, when her son, who's been silent the entire film, starts to speak, finds his voice, and in heavy-handed metaphor, justice does too. And I'm going to read one more. I'm trying to figure out if I want to go way back to imagine being more afraid of freedom than slavery, or if I want to read a new one from my, from my book, from my new book. What? Both? OK. If one is fortunate, and I can't speak for everyone, but some may receive a gift, a talent, Lever to pull in cases of emergency, like the black box found in planes with instructions on how to survive, something, someone that serves as a preserver, a raft in flood waters. As many of you know, my lifeline has always been poetry. From the time I was eight years old and I heard an infomercial for poetry by Maya Angelou and still I rise. It opened up the windows, made me know what is possible, which is why I can't disparage anything about Maya Angelou, as some do, because she saved me. I always wanted to write a children's story about a hero called poetry, that in dire times we can speak and create her. As an aside, I often wonder about America's fascination with superheroes. Perhaps it's an alter ego, a Jekyll and Hyde, that a country on the regular that commits atrocities could have its heart in children's stories and superheroes, a sign that it never grew up. And just so you know, I was offended by Black Panther being categorized as a drama at the Academy Awards and the decision to re-release it in theaters during Black History Month so all black children could see it. Just imagine if white history was shoved or shown a year, uh, oh, what is it, instead of year round, how would they feel if the movie about them was The Incredibles? I mean, I'm just saying. Anyway, it was education that led me out of the suburbs and sure fate for black girls and women to Northeastern University I attended with Wendy Williams. And there again, I discovered through the African American Institute, poetry and theater, and still it was writing and theater that led me to the new school, that led me to my first writing class with Jane Lazar. And when I wrote about a black girl that caused nothing but shame and pain, a black girl so ugly her own mother would not accept her, a black girl who was cursed from birth until death and left to wage her own war against the world that cursed her, she knew it was me. She wrote at the bottom of my papers, yours is the best poetry writing I've ever read in all my years of teaching. And her words gave me for the first time, gave me a sense of worth and purpose. And after I'd gotten heavily into drugs and one morning on a Lower East Side tenement strung out, I decided to jump from the roof and kill myself. The only thing I could think to live for was poetry. 
And I'm saying all of this to say, I've taken the long and scenic route to tell you it was me, not a craft, that became my mother's hero. I was a champion from the early age of nine during my father's beatings when she would instruct me to call the police and later when over the holidays he gave her nothing I stole from department stores to give her presents and she would tell my father later saying my daughter will give me presents. As an adult I went there and sometimes stood between my father and she during their arguments and was her words get an education that led me out of the suburbs into higher education. I was able to escape her fate. I'm writing this now to say, despite all of my valiant efforts, I can no longer be my mother's hero. All of these years, even though high femme, I've always had a sense of bravado that I could save anyone. It showed up in my teaching with students, anyone in a dark place. I'd show up in my raft and I'd toss them a preserver. And only now, the enemy is death. I see my mother descending, and I cannot pry open the jaws, a fate where even poetry cannot intervene. And we're going to kick it back all the way back. The saddest thing in the world has got to be when you love someone unable to provide the love and support you need and staying with them would be a form of suicide. It took all I had to leave her. Emotionally, she still has a part of me. A year of therapy to resolve something an honest conversation might have solved and now I'm stuck with everything I didn't say and she's not here to say it to. I tried to pretend it didn't hurt as much as it did, searched all over this earth for a safe place, and I can't walk up to somebody and ask them to give me back to myself. I just keep searching inside, hoping to find an answer. Maybe she's my mother. Maybe she's my father. Maybe she embodies all the insecurity I've ever felt, and that's why I keep coming back here over and over. I ask myself, is it love? But it isn't desire that drives me back to her. It's the fact she has a piece of me. I want the pain to end, to belong to myself, and freedom to love someone who loves me back. I don't want any more illusions, no more women who appear powerful and underneath have the emotional life of a two-year-old. I'm keeping the same standard for myself. I am aware and responsible for my life. And it's hard to believe that. I want to give my power to anyone, anything passing by, because I'm terrified to own myself. If we owned ourselves, we could overturn this earth. There'd be no reason to destroy everything we are, but it's easier and it's safer to stay small. In Nicaragua, one man owned an entire peninsula and all the food peasants picked belonged to him, which they had to, after aching and sore muscles, buy back. When the Sandinistas revolted, some of the peasants were given their own land and machinery, but seven years later, the machines were still sitting there unoperated because the people hadn't been taught to take care of, to take care of themselves. And in the 1800s, after that long war, some of the slaves went back to the plantation. Imagine being more afraid of freedom than slavery. Constantly sabotaging and squeezing into places too small for your potential. And even though you know this, you can't stop because slavery is all you know. They ask why? Why don't women leave lovers who abuse them? There is no land where we are free. I was not taught to honor myself. I am painting a simple portrait. There are factors I haven't mentioned, like lovers who say that they will kill us, declare us unfit for our children, no money, and no place to go. In India, women are encouraged to abort girl children. My mother was beaten so badly, the doctor said that she would die, and she stayed. But I'm making a promise to myself as this earth is my witness. I 
am going to be free. And I won't have to stand here dragging these dead pieces of flesh, searching for a scrap of something to cover myself. And maybe you never saw somebody fall to the floor and ask God for a way out of the wilderness. Maybe you never loved somebody so bad that you stumbled out like a rag doll dragged across the coals. When Harriet met John Tubman, he was the most beautiful man. Something about his feet, his hands, a back unscarred by slavery. And she dreamt that they would settle somewhere, his arm across her shoulder, their lives firmly entwined. But slavery infiltrated every aspect of their lives. Sometimes it disguised itself, and other times it stood in obstruction to every effort. And Harry tried to explain how Earth was an invitation. She never saw the river, never touched the trees. The sun would dry out of her eyes, and she would die. But John saw himself like a bird without wings. Aren't I enough, he would ask. And even though she left him in the dry dust of a summer day, she felt abandoned. The night Harriet left slavery, the wind spoke a strange song, an idiom without bass or baritone, the shrill sound of glass, a cry as she crept up to each cabin and sang a spiritual. She looked over the landscape and she remembered how God spoke to Moses through the burning bush. Tell Pharaoh. On Christmas, an old and dutiful slave is waiting for Harriet's visit, but her daughter has gone north. And that night, the blues gave birth to a paraplegic, a woman with no legs, the sound of cymbals, an earthquake. All over the world, wars, people plagued by the same ills as their oppressor. The real revolution is changing myself. Thank you. I think Pamela Sneed is our great orator. It's amazing to listen to you. And our wonderful poet, historian, I need the Pamela Sneed film column. Um, when we were putting together this particular program in a symposium organized around nationalism, questions of nationalism, thinking about voice in particular, um, I was imagining um, chorus and polyvocals and multilingualism, the crossing and confluence of languages. And so it felt incredibly important to have Latasha Diggs with us, someone whose poetry I think um, contains and projects out so many different times and places and peoples and registers of speech. And so it's a great honor to welcome her now to this podium. I just like for you guys to focus, not on me, but uh, what's in the background. And I'll tell you, I'll tell you, Kyle, when to press play. Okay. Alrighty. Make sure. Do 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 do. Eight. Okay. And it's it's dark enough y'all be able to see the the viz. We can we darken it more? Let's darken it more. Yeah. Okay.
Okay, ready. Tending to drunk mothers. As is gentle, as with all chosen mothers, aunties, nanas, the nurturing observed with kin, not kin, likely kin, but always kindred, don't steal from the gumball machine, offer instructions with a now baby, don't raise your voice, kin. Raise your arm to support her weight. Tender, always tender, toward pitch of excitement. Hear how you pick up the phone, as kin expect you should accept. You will eventually anticipate the situation. Care for your future version. Near fledgling, never near adult. The upward down, obliged to depend, soon accountable, something owed to who birthed you. To them, for her, their service, all those years, a type of mothering, not mothering, a worrying, did she teach you how to fly, though? Child. Ain't no does it, does not want to be accountable, don't want, don't know, doesn't say tenderly nor delightfully that she can't, will fail at it. Why surprise? What have you offered your youth inside this raggedy ass toolkit? Sharpen the focus onto who never knew your family, savor their conversation, sometimes trips to Costco, wisdom, clean belly buttons, Q-tips dipped in olive oil, let them talk calamine and Vicks, collagen gummies, suckle onto those necessities, nag and atrophy, caring to take sweet care, you're honest about new rituals what she can but won't say she did didn't don't choke over what she didn't do she tried and tried of doing and tired of doing and doing and doing attrition for the pickled child of a blitz mother what the blood never taught what hand reared ill parent thought they taught Expectations stay unexpected, say, cause shit, they old. Sip till black, slip down staircase, she dipped head, clipped eyelid, she drips vomit, grip more sip, she busted lip, she dribble, she as in drools, she careful, she tiptoe through the number two, she rides as in MTA, each stop a prowler, skip slide, Komodo sip good for worms, a choke from Paul Mall's bits of navy, sweet scotch snuff, cradled in gums, zip up to bear down, flapper goes hips, she omit directions from the script, she snip that flabby clip, edit that there tidbit, she quit, more like cold turkey soup, she skipped the training session on how to be a mother, no tips, no blip, no contract with no maternity nurse signed, what CPS got to do with it? Rescript instead, biopic onto corn chips for myths. What she ain't fed was fit. Dalonige is chaliga, chal chalagi for yellow, as in the color of bile. as in bile from vomiting nothing, as in a trigger, as in a scent, so sulfurous, so memorable, she screech, her whimsical enchanted labyrinth and fascist collision with window guards. She considered once a dive out the kitchen window onto the playground of King's Towers. Daughter did dive onto a fire escape once, halted by a pot of espada je saum hoje. Knows from the price is right how to spin that wheel. 
am not well. Tla oshta yawa damanta, tla oshta yawa nadanta. I'm not well. Am not well. Tla oshta yawa nadanta, tla oshta yawa nadanta. Am not well. Tla oshta yawa nadanta, tla oshta yawa nadanta, tla oshta yawa nadanta. I am not well. Ushti is Chalagi for baby. Her name is Anastasia. Margie, her middle is after your mother. His name is you. Kiyoshi, her name is. His name is Chaden. Nami, her name is. His name is Hiroshi. Japanese for generous. Her name is Aroha. For love, Lightfoot, her middle name is. After your Elogi, your aunt Loki. Loki is hot. His name is Lin. Hopi for flute. A lion's heart. Scandinavian. His middle name is Robert. After your uncle, your Educi. Maai. Her name is Coyote. Is Veda for internal knowledge. Sanskrit. Too many foreign films. Ain't filling Kwanzaa. We won't name you Imani. Yoruba is so cliche. Hushno, beauty. Mary, her middle name is after your aunt Oluche. She arrived. She came. Atahua, beautiful. Elizabeth is her middle name. His middle name is Joshua. After your grandfather. After your great grandfather. Odudu. No one will be named after your father. Dues. Patir. Miss Daisy lived in 2FW. She distilled water by boiling it. She sprinkled ammonia outside her door to ward off evil spirits. My first period took place in her bathroom. Her husband was a Pan-Africanist. He spoke little, sold his Marcus Garvey flags and pins from his green van outside the state building. The last tenant was a chain smoker and filthy cat owner. The real estate agent will only show you should you make 40 times the monthly rent and annual income. Zillow feels so lonely. HOA fees are depressing. Aged out as in past ripe, the seeds dried up. She wish it would each month. Truth. Hear those words made fact sting awkward questions from the new GYN. Oh, tío, so your period stopped? Crease in midriff reminds her of the last lyric, I willed my moon. Spare her lord of these hereditary titties, non-status titties. The app only serves to monitor the mood. Turn off the Jeffrey Osborne and the Joan Osborne. She pours no future down the bowl from her diva cup. Won't carry the shakers ever. I willed every tadpole to die. Lima bean ain't a nickname for her own. She won't name the birds. She never gave her plants names. Somewhere in there a possibility was or two. She wish it would each month. Now wishes, ni Shiba Inu, call me Kitsune. Imagine for a second she envies a breeder, woulda, coulda, there shouldn't, there shoulda, there shoulda. This sure ain't antebellum. Oh, what a sad purchase you might have been. Perhaps her genes ain't hardy. I will this. Perhaps every month when blood leaks opportunity, the lining cries, no, nah, not again, not again. Detox pearls. Had I willed me sterile, wanders in thought like a bee lister clutching her ferro faucet dew. A co-op has rules, a lie after all, Perry too cold and Menno too hot. This just ain't right. All it is. Her last winter here, at least the radiators are whistling. 
I wheeled my cycle return upon this residential closure, beginning the end of woe she wished it would each month. Oluche. He named her Oluche. She survived, daughter of men, daughters of man. Shadik, or was it Ijo? Topsy thumper, make he trust your tremor and kindly back up. Hand no wrist bone impaled on cheetah, mauve comforter. This is a sweet 16 fuck. Umber that ratchet oil paint is his musk. Velvet shower curtain, black light bathroom. The neck, no back, cracks winching, drafted to spread and freeze shut. Digging and straddling, pressed against the sweaty toilet. Granny canny outside, every gasp ruled, distracting Funyuns for Cas. He doing his business. Rats must expel their droppings in that wall's crack. Roots of frost banged against tile grout. Don't even hiccup. Your buds are your buds, iris a shade of grizzly. Maybe we make pretty babies. Irritant is your natural sound. Rough roll down, he slams. There is a squeak. What business is it of you, damn it? Play death. Play dumb, your moaning is making him soft. Tremors from all that trap hushing, trying not to disappoint. Hoof gold blues may heave less, the place on edge of bed facing Fifth Avenue, fearful his mother might hear us. Flash of hand raised to slap at earth, neck bone pitched at toilet bowls or headboards, dreams drafted then ruptured. Deltoid, torn, shattered patella, and so on. That his future. Thought this be quiet storm, easy, as in gentle, as in worth the carefree, curl, home, kit, froze, shut. Ruffles, salt and vinegar, 25 cents. A fupa pat with his business in the panic the breasts quickly recover to my first brassiere. So this is your first time fucking? Erasable neighborhood boy. Shit. So dumb, you me messed up. Roller coasters and Ferris wheels. French kissing should mean something. Bowl of Werther's, double mints, milk duds. Dilugu is chalagi for rice. Sakui sikwa one hog. Corner tub fat back. Kakalak plated woodpeckers. Dalala she drives. Into town you log sailing beams exposed. Drives you. Hawiya ukanyansan. Bacon corner tub. Miss Charlene, the name, cook a mean rice and peas, sugar beans, turrets, but rice and peas, the way you like it. Back in Kakalaki, here rice fields no more to keep company, someone. From the West Indies, a big black mud of a hound, breeding in Tupelo, a wobbler, wrap around porch, all new China. Canadian geese come, here all the time, the river, the swamp bordered by Yakin, Jordan, wall to wall, hardwood walls and floors. This muck gonna keep the cotton mouths from your chicken, a ramp for you, for your scooter. Inferno of 1992. Twentieth anniversary. Troy. Boom 
comes eternal dew to fitness of recent raindrops could be an automatic skylight blocked by pre-war beams charred save me a shower heavy rain and climate change and rollades won't he will the American cockroach on its back is said to be introduced to the Americas thanks to the Atlantic slave trade. Who knew? There is no field, there is no farm, no ticks to tweeze, no snapper and bucket, no snapper to make a soup, no rice and liver. Instead, ponder the pain threshold. Inside dumbbell tenement limestone and airy, hers is perhaps not sensational enough for a headline. Make pace for the stomp grounds. There is only an unkept cemetery. Graves spread apart, some without gravestones. Ubisunt sepulcra, one under a tree. Pleated are delusions driving in circles. The landscape changed, the sandbank traps those haunted. The trap house stalks your ride. Avoid the hypnosis. Want nothing? Ain't no sign of life but the pines question. Why return to this? What did she honestly expect? What the estranged nephew said? Everything is dead. The Carolina gold from the fine fair on 116th and Lennox Foods some 40 years before. Keep her wits. Give her some sugar, God sent. The devil loves corporophages and around the corner someone knows the family. Newer faces, now older residents. Kin boarded up Mysteries of the illegitimate pain, this toothless cousin, a hound stands guard on the porch. Be grateful mommy went up north, near the chipping walls, near drywall blistered by decline in memory, lips are zipped, any evidence long thrown in the trash. Otito, there is an easier process. Only the study of roaches agonizing with the glue trap. Limb by limb escaping, are you reckoning with the two free fill-ups the real estate agent took agency over your calm demeanor and newfound inquiry into property taxes, LLCs, and gut renovations? Be grateful for the downy and red belly woodpeckers up north. Like you, your limbs are unglued. And I'll stop there. Thanks. We'll just get set up for the conversation part. Thank you again to both Pamela and to Latasha, and thank you. Um, I love listening to both of you. Uh, and I was really feeling so much in your reading, Pamela, the presence of these different characters. In your reading, Latasha, 
the presence of setting and the disappearance of setting. Um, in putting together this event, I was thinking about what even is a voice? You know, what, what, what even is a voice? What is a voice? Because I think we can imagine a voice as a physical quality. I love listening to your, your physical embodied voices. Um, but I think we can also imagine a voice as a particular manner of speech or a particular point of view that one might have. Um, but maybe somewhere I want to begin, partly because of the two particular readings you shared, is maybe thinking about a voice as a story. And if we think about a voice as a story, I want to ask each of you where you think the story of your voice begins. Well, I mean, I think that when I was thinking about like the work that I put together and that I presented, uh, like poetry, you know, is my voice, right? Poetry is is the thing that has saved me, and um, and I talk about like seeing Maya Angelou for the first time. You know, I think I was like eight years old, and they had these infomercials, and she said, "And still I rise." And I didn't I didn't know in the world that there could be such a thing as a poet, you know. And then so to see her was the birth, I think, of my voice, you know. Um, and then I was thinking about like Audre Lorde, I don't know, I talk about Audre all the time, but um, thinking about like silence, right, and the fact that I'm always coming to voice, like, you know, like the way that it's kind of presented is that we break silence and that we break silence once, but really I find like it's this ongoing process of coming to voice, so I feel like, okay, I'll write something and I think, wow, that really exposes me, and then it's like, and then I have to go to the next layer, and then I have to go to the next layer, right, and so that I'm always breaking breaking silences i'm always coming to voice i'm all like you know um on a daily basis i have to contemplate voice right um um during pamela's reading i, I believe it was a line in one of the pieces where you said that I come from runaways? Well, it was something to the effect that you come from runaways. Runaways, yeah. Right, and I was sitting there and I said to myself, I don't believe I come from runaways. Um, that I believe that uh, that I descend from some folks who were too scared to run, um, which was very, very, you know, that happened. Um, and, and so when you ask the question of um, where does my voice come from, like where is it coming from? I'm, you know, I'm thinking, I'm thinking right now because I'm kind of like deep in this this new thing that I'm writing. I'm, I'm, I'm. It's 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 coming from uh, a lot of folks who were unable to speak, who were afraid. Yeah. Well, when, um, when Latasha finished, I said, you know, that middle passage, you know, I whispered in her ear. And, um, and so, and I mean, I feel like there's like a correlation. There's like this, this historical thing that like, we're not only just speaking our voice, like we're speaking, you know, for vessels, for voices that were silenced, that were, I mean, I think like there was a thread about talking about slavery and the middle passage and those things. Um, 
Yeah, and so anyway, I'm interested too in like, not just like what we're speaking of and what we're responding to presently, but also those voices that we carry. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, no, I, I, I totally agree with you. Um, it's, it's like what I'm adding to that, right? Um, you know, moving from the middle passage, um, into our contemporary times that um that you know um there were those um even more present much more present that um uh were unable to have a voice who were unable to run away who were unable to fight right um and um, and that's what I'm that's that's what I'm thinking about right now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. These these microphones are a little strange. <laughs> They're distorting our voices. It's a very echoic room. Oh, okay, okay. Um, and both of you collaborated very courageously with the the bells and the physical architecture <laughs> of of this place. Um, I wonder how you're thinking about place in relation to voice. Um, you were you're both kind of speaking about people um, and the ways that, um, that people are sort of being channeled into what constitutes a voice. But what about, what about place? Hmm. Well, the places that... Um I was projecting, right? Um, those places carry memories. They carry memories of um, neighbors that I grew up with, uh, neighbors who never spoke to me, um, uh, and those places um, also are kind of having this like weird conversation in that like who is going to remember who is going to remember who occupied this space um, will there be any evidence of that are you know are we just lost to spatial memory right the erasure of spatial memory Right, and what that does to the psychic and what that does to you emotionally. Um, and that, um, you know, I can't, like, for some reason, I, I got Remember Me in my head um, from that animation, Coco, right? You know, it's like, um, like whoever is the last to remember will, will, keep, will carry on the story of that individual um, but if there's no place right if there's no physical if there's no windows no molding no, no transom you know there's there's nothing really there left to say who was here yeah yeah, for me, I think, like, place is, like, is my body, you know, place is, is you know, sort of, like, my mind, um, you know, I have a visual show up, and, um, and, like, all, there are all these, um, you know, different paintings and, and stuff, and, um, and I was talking to someone yesterday, and I said that I feel like it's, like, my family album, but it's, like, my brain kind of, uh, I don't know, it's, like, my, what's inside of me sort of, like, being, you know, being made external, right? And I was thinking about, and I said something about like polyrhythmic, like, you know, when I make poetry, I'm always like uh, creating these kind of like tapestries. So there are these inner monologues like made external, but I think that like they're never linear. They're always like kind of circular, you know? And I think like my visual work is like that too. I'm trying to express m like multiple thoughts at a time. So there's always like, there's, there's the, you know, there's the personal, there's the political, there's this person, there's that person. It's like, you know, these flashes of things, and that's the way, you know, I think 
trying to create different kinds of like thought patterns and different uh, different ways of, of speaking and looking, right? And I try to sort of like create that in my poetry, but I create that in my visual work as well. So it always feels like polyrhythmic, right? But it's 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 the so it's all happening in my body, so being made, you know, the internal being made external, right? You know, and like, interestingly enough, like when I teach, I'm always like, use your body, use your body. Like writing just doesn't come from the mind. Writing comes from every single part of ourselves, right? And so it's like building awareness, like what's happening in your toes? What's happening, like, what are you wearing? You know, what are your fingers doing? What's happening in your stomach? What's happening in your neck, right? So building, so all of that has to go into the work. Right? Um, so yeah, body is, is the place, right? For me, yeah. And then talking a lot about identity, right? You know, um, yeah, and responding a lot to, you know, what's happening in the news and what's happening with film and all that stuff, yeah. So a lot of responses, yeah. Natasha, you were talking about um these forces that threaten erasure of place. Um, and I think that there are, we live under so many conditions and forces that also want to obliterate or minimize or take away voice. And I'm wondering, you know, what, how do we counter that? What are we doing individually or collectively countering that? Well, I made a zine last year, um, which was if the Capitol rioters had been black. And uh, I didn't read from it today, but um, it's like a pamphlet. And, um, and I really feel like it's important to just keep speaking out. Like, I feel like there's been a huge cover up with regard to that. I mean, they're still, you know, they're still saying, oh, you know, should we prosecute Trump? You know, will he be prosecuted? It's like, yes, he should absolutely be prosecuted, right? But it's just sort of like, you know, the complicity of the media, of the government, all these forces, like, sort of like taking that out of our, uh, out of our consciousness, right? Like, and, um, and so I felt like it was important to, like, create a zine, like, you know, kind of like gangster style right so that we could like have a dialogue that we can keep talking about like what I mean what happened on January 6th was atrocious and I mean now they're having the trials and stuff like that um, and we'll see if anything will be done but I also feel like it's like my my place as a as a poet uh, you know in a public you know servant basically to keep putting things into people's consciousness that may be, you know, disappeared or that, you know what I mean? Or even like, you know, saying the thing, like I started out with a new poem, you know, talking about like my perpetrators being women. And that is like the scariest thing ever to say, you know, because it's like we have such a, you know, uh, a small narrative when it comes to abuse and what it looks like and all of that other stuff. And so it's terrifying to, for me to change that narrative or to assert it. But then I come into these spaces and I'm like, okay, I'm going to start here. So in a way, I mean, it comes back to like that breaking silence, right? That we, we have to have the courage to sort of like speak the unspeakable, to be uncomfortable, to live with this discomfort, um, so that we can build some like real dialogues, you know? I mean, I don't think that... Um, I don't think that we can build communities based on superficial things, you know, like I think like sometimes like identity is not enough, you know, to sustain us, you know, we're all queer, so we all hang out together. Well, that doesn't really work, right? And I actually think of like Sadia Hartman, like at the end of, um, what is it, Lose Your Mother, where, you know, she's like searching around the slave forts and she doesn't really find her home necessarily in blackness, but in free communities, but in people who come together with this like mind of every race, of every class, you know, that come together in, in, in pursuit of this freedom. Right? And so that's like, so, and I mean, I'm being really general because I read the book a while ago, but I, I remember that conclusion. Right? So that it's not based on like identity stuff, it's based on like principles of freedom that we come together. I just remembered that I was instructed by Urayon Noel um, 
to bring New York to this space. So um, as a New Yorker, the voices, right? Um, and how do we counter that? Um, I honestly do not have a question, a answer for that. My only answer is to document. Um, as someone born and raised in New York um, who navigated the Lower East Side and St. Mark's Place very often, it's sad to see Shiraku gone. It's really sad to see that gone. And it's even sadder to see Sunrise Grocery gone. Um, it hurt when St. Mark's Bookstore turned into a coffee shop. Um, but to think about sound and voices, right, the types of voices you would hear from the cantankerous um, asshole that worked in the bookstore, right, to some like asshole customer, you know, to the conversations that were going on in the back of St. Mark's bookstore, you know, over all of the ma foreign magazines, right, or then, you know, Shiraku, right, how, it's a Japanese-owned business, but um, there was, it, 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 it um, like my big brother, who um, is no longer with us, GT, you know, that was his spot, right? His spot was there, so there was all, we were always there. Um, to that supermarket, supermarket, right? So the thing is, you have the clientele, you have the folks that work there, you have the constant listings in Japanese and in English, right? And if it's in Japanese, you know they want a Japanese person to take the job, right? <laughs> you know, like someone looking for this, someone looking for that. Um, even with just the listings that you don't even equate, you may not equate to Sonic. There was a Sonic, a Sonics that was happening, even with that, with that type of signage. Um, and the, the freezing that, that has occurred, particularly at that corner, it's, it's not quiet, it's very loud, right? The erasure is loud, right? The only evidence is a, a letter saying thank you to our customers or the, the original signage logo of Shiraku, right? But it's very, very mute, muted by all of the other activity. And my only thing is, is documentation. Right, documentation to what? I don't know, L later on do something with it to amplify it in some way. Um, uh, in New York, particularly, you know, um, there, there's voices every, I mean, everywhere. <laughs> you know, I mean, um, you know, but it's also the, vo like, wh what voices, right? I think um, the one thing that I think about are the voices of development versus the voices of, um, of urban development, of affordable housing, of, um, of um, property um, development, you know, foreign investment, those voices versus the, the voices of the renters versus the, the voices of, you know, um, the, the, um, the night laborers, the day laborers, um, the adjuncts, because um, we're not making any money either. Um, and what we say versus what they say, right? To think about like the history of how a development could be justified if something is framed as a slum or the occupants are framed as vermin, right? Which is why I was like so like tickled by the, 
the trivial history about the cockroach, which I know is a water bug. You know, those big ones that fly, that you don't want, you run. You know, <laughs> you, know you just run, you're like, you know, uh, that's a, and that's a sonic too. But you know, you you don't met, you just you just flee. You can't like I can't right. You stop it. It doesn't die right. But but you know to think about how you know uh, over years, over decades, uh, to justify the removal or the erasure or the silencing of a community, right? of a people, right, to equate them as vermin justifies why we must eradicate them, why we need to move them somewhere else, right? And so then, you know, we scammer. Obviously, naturally, where are we going to go, you know? And then to think about um, what happens then you know, with the, you know, and I'm going to quote Claudia here because we were talking about the, you know, just the ongoing issue of folks who are mentally ill, folks who are unhoused, how unhoused leads to mental illness. And the, th the thought of that, well, some of these folks might have lost their, dare their caretakers, right? Caretakers being parents caretakers being, you know, older friends that kept them grounded, right? Um, if you're without your caretaker, if you're without your, like, daily phone call, you know, how do you deal with everything that's going on in New York, you know, on your own, um, without those possible resources, especially when someone has said you're vermin? How do you amplify yourself to say you're not? Yeah. <laughs> no, I, I just was thinking about like, it was important that you mentioned like how gentrification has disappeared us, has erased us in a certain way and like taken away so many voices. And um, yeah, I didn't, uh, I didn't read a poem about that. Um, but I have a couple, you know, um, and uh, there's a new thing that I wrote and there's like, there's like, in my neighborhood in Brooklyn, there's like this old school, like, uh, Latinx guy that I've seen forever and then there are all these like you know new white incoming settlers or something right and uh, and like one of our stores went out of business and it was like it was devastating to see it was I think it was like Korean owned and I mean they've been there forever right and then um, and then they went out of business because all these sto these new stores came in and so one day I was like you know walking by and like there was like there was this old school guy like you know latinx guy standing in the and uh, standing in the doorway of the new store and he's like you're the reason why they went out of business you're the reason why they went out of business right and, and i mean it was just like really funny to like see this like confrontation you know but and it, it, it got me thinking and writing about how much history is even you know history her story trans story is like is in the shelves you know is in the purchases and like feeling like you know they've like watched me like the store is the witness to so much that's happened in the neighborhood and that happens with individuals you know um so yeah and then it makes me think of like i think it's a, the district six museum in south africa like where they like completely obliterated you know people's homes and and uh forced them to move forced relocation and um and then there's like this museum and it's actually really beautiful and they have like poems by people who were displaced like you know embedded in the tiles and the floor and i remember being really moved by that and um and then thinking like you know again we're we're going through our own kind of like displacement um our erasure you know um and like not really having any language for it you know because everybody's just like smiling and have a nice day you know and it's like in all these like incredibly um horrible things i mean in a way they're saying um We should get up and dance. 
Um, yeah, like because certain groups have more visibility, we're thinking that we have more voice, right? And it's like it's not true, right? So there's so there's this like really strange thing of like this dichotomy of having all this visibility but having our voices like kind of like disappear. I mean, or even like thinking about I mean where we've come in terms of women's rights and then having like Roe versus Wade overturned, you know what I mean? In twenty in twenty twenty two. You know, it's like, how can this be? Or having like, you know, lynchings and racial killings, like, you know, and so we're supposed to like be thinking like, oh, you know, we're so progressive, but we're losing all of these rights, all of these advances, if we really had any, I don't know. So, so, so many voices are disappearing or so many things we don't have language for, like I was saying the other day, um, like I feel like there's apartheid everything, you know, in America. You know, like we were talking about gay and lesbian history and I was like, oh, it's so segregated, right? Because it's like told from the standpoint of like one group and like, you know, black lesbians, particularly with regard to like AIDS narratives, which is what I write about, you know, black lesbians like, you know, don't have any voice, you know, it's just sort of like groups of people, like, you know, so we think that we're so progressive and all this other stuff, but still we have all this segregation within our communities who gets to tell the story right whose stories you know whose stories get published right whose stories get published without a fight you know what I mean like um, so the bottom line is is that there is an illusion that we have voice when we don't you know there's and um, yeah and that also like I think like you know South Africa when I left there in 2011 one of the things that I thought was that you know, they're luckier because they still have language for apartheid, right? They can still talk about like what happened. We don't have any language, right? So they took away our eyes, they took away our teeth, they took away everything, our tongue, right? And so, so the bottom line is how can you ever address racism? How can you ever address these things if you don't have a language to say it even exists? Do you know what I mean? And that we're facing that in so many ways. I'll ask one more question. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, we're talking about all of these different ways that uh, particular aspects of community are under various kinds of precarity, especially the community that we're in here. And um, something I think often have thought through the pandemic, prior to the pandemic, always is um, uh, this enterprise of listening to poetry is always kind of under precarity. Um, it's always, from my perspective, moving in and out of um, periods of thriving and resilience and periods of really facing a margin. And so I wonder why, why do you think we continue to come to places to listen to poetry? Well, I always say, you know, listen to the poets. You know, like sometimes I, um, you know, sometimes I'll go to a show and I'm like, and you know, people, you know, it'll be about race. And I'm like, but the poets have covered that. The poets covered that like 20 years ago. You know what I mean? And so I really feel like the, the, the poets are like social commentators that are always, they're always there. And they're all, and they're, they're, their vision is, is shrewd and their language is shrewd. And, um, and I mean, I go to like survive. I mean, these are the free communities where you do go and we come together and we organize around the word. And um, there's so much possibility. I mean, I do think that um, we're entering into, you know, surviving the pa pandemic, those of us who've survived, right, um, and are surviving this racial stuff that's going on and surviving, you know, all this, like, these attacks against trans women and against, you know, cis women and, you know, period. Um, that I think it's an exciting time in the sense that like people are out and about, we've been cooped up, you know, and like people are coming back to like, you know, make art, you know, and, um, and so our resilience, I think, 
uh, is shown in art. You know, I think like, you know, listening to Latasha's work and then also in my work, you know, the big thing was the survivor, you know, the cockroach, you know, and it's like the artists are survivors, you know, and um, well, hopefully, you know, if they don't cut all the funding and all that stuff, you know what I mean? But we managed to, to come through, right? Um, and so I think that the possibility of community, of kinship, of, of language, of possibility. I mean, I think all of that is in poetry. And, um, and I think that, you know, that this is an exciting time that the pandemic has given wave. To, like, I think that, you know, everything's been dormant and on hold for a while and that we're coming back, you know, together. And, um, and there's something like exciting about it and there's something urgent about it. And, you know, people are doing things like every day, like my schedule is like packed. I gotta go see things and do things. Um, so, and I do feel like an excitement, you know, kind of like in the air to see each other again and to hear each other, to get back to this art thing. So there's always possibility. Language is always growing and, and it's healing. And, um, and that's why we have to keep poetry alive and that's why we go and listen to it and, you know, be in it, you know? Yeah. I laughed um, because I was like, I don't know why you would come and listen to me, honestly. You know, um, uh, I don't know. Um, why do I listen to it? I listen to it to be surprised, to take in the layers that overlap, um, much like that stained glass there. You know, it looks like an armadillo. Um, it doesn't look like an armadillo. Um, it looks something like crustacean-ish. But um, the writers that I listen to are much like that, right? They're surprising me with those overlaps where I can't figure out exactly what is it. Um, I think also, I think also of the first time I ever showed a poem. Uh, and there's a couple of firsts. I can't remember the first first, but there's a couple of firsts. And one of the firsts was sitting on the floor at the knitting factory, the original knitting factory, um, and sharing this poem about Kung Fu with Darius James and how that led to my very first reading, um, which was then haggled by John Ferris and Steve Cannon, um, which then led me to becoming very Harlem and cursing out Steve Cannon, because I didn't know about the tradition of haggling. Um, and I, I'm, I'm from a Harlem, you don't call me a bitch. Who the fuck are you, right? Um, but, all that is to say was like I wanted to share something. I, I wanted to share something. I wanted to share a poem that was pretty much personal. Um, and over the years, um, I've disengaged because I started to ask myself, okay, what are folks doing? And why am I not getting that, right? Something, something's happening. Or it's like, or am I in a funk, right? It might just be me. Um, and I need to go hibernate. I need to be in a cave until um, I can hear again and hear much in the way that stained glass looks, right? And we come to be surprised, we come to learn, we come to discover. Um, we come to face something that we've never 
dealt with. Um, we don't come for the finger snaps. <laughs> we don't come for the finger snaps. Um, the, the finger stabs or surface. Okay. All right. So w what else are you doing? Um, And we come to be involved, right? And I think as I get older too, you know, I come to be fair. Like as an older writer, I come to be fair. I come to be fair with a fair ear. What does that mean? It's not the 30 year old ear the judgment ear, the judging ear. It's the, okay, this has potential, or this is fucking amazing ear, right? Or like, fuck, I gotta go back and write some shit. You know, I come with that ear. I come with that ear. I come with that, I need to learn, I need to understand. I need to be fair with what younger folks are doing. And I need to take heed and listen over and over and over again to what the elders have been writing. Thank you, thank you. The story of that stained glass window is fire. When the roof of the church burned down, that was the window that the poets put in to catch all of the colors of the sun. So when you say that, I think about time, destruction, resilience. Um, so thank you for bringing us there. Thank you both for your readings and for your conversation. Thank you to folks who are listening and tuning in on the live stream. Um, we'll be back here tomorrow at 4 p.m for readings and conversation with Laura and Stephen Sheehy, David Ang, and Anne Pellegrini. Thank you.